the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom, you just saw how it developed. So let's talk about what? The state. So what kind of a state will it have? Right? Obviously, unitary state. Right? And look up the definition again if you forgot what it means. So unitary state, right? Why? Obviously, because the whole foundation, the whole construction of the United Kingdom as a state was a process of taking power from the regions, from the uh, um, periphery, and putting it into the center. And that makes it unitary. So unitary means that there is one source of power, and that is London. Why? Because that's how the whole thing was created, right? Um, and unitary also means that there is no other government in the state uh, that has any power, right? Except for that, uh, those uh, levels of government that the central government decides to create and endow with power. So it's up to the central government to give, delegate such power and make up such levels of government. Indeed, and that, that actually happened recently. In the last 15 years, not more, 20, maybe 20, 15, 18 years, after Tony Blair, there was a process of so-called devolution. Because this, it, it used to be a very centralized. Remember, remember that unitary country, uh, states can be centralized or decentralized. They keep more power or delegate more power. Well, devolution is not a word for decentralization, but it was invented and in, in, uh, applied here, so use this word. Devolution is creating such local levels of government. So in the last, again, 15, 18 years, there has been a revolutionary change, which led recently, as I mentioned, to uh, one of these component units uh, getting this close to declaring independence. The, the results were 45% of the population was four. That's 5% away. Um, Population of Scotland, of course, who voted for it. So devolution happened, and thus the United Kingdom started to give, to establish in, the, in these last 15 years, to re-establish after centuries, levels of government in the component nations. And they actually consider themselves nations, because the state of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland is composed of nations. The component nations are English for England, Scotland, almost didn't, almost didn't uh, remain, uh, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Now, why Northern Ireland? We didn't cover that. At the beginning of the 20th century, Ireland gained its independence through fight from the British. And an important thing that, you know, consistently created an unbridgeable barrier between Ireland remaining and, I mean, accepting a sort of a forced unification or not, was the fact that culturally, well, religion, Irish being Catholic, and that, cre that helped distinguish the Irish identity more so that, than the Scottish and the Welsh identity who have their own national, quote unquote, uh, churches. But uh, Irish are Catholic. But why then do you have Northern Ireland still part of the UK? And then you have an independent sovereign state called Ireland. Because in the north, a few counties in the north, the mix of Catholic Irish and Protestant Irish, and some of them in, uh, and inheritors, well, descendants of former, um, you know, Englishmen who came to settle there, or in, uh, who just fought on the side of the Irish. The point is, in the north, you have a few counties in, on the island of Ireland that where the population is mixed between those who consider themselves Irish as opposed to English or British, and they're Catholic, and those who are Protestant and have a historical connection with, the, with Britain. So Protestants and Catholics, but not understood as religion, because it's not religion that separates them, it's identity. You see how national identity is shaped by many factors, and in this case, how religion becomes one of these things. It could be color or bias, it doesn't matter. You can choose any criteria, right? That's not the point. The point is, it's identity, and that shapes it. So Northern Ireland being so mixed, it was decided, agreed, when Ireland became sovereign state, to remain in uh, the UK. Troubled, because the Catholics there were still not, well, the Irish, the, the Republicans, so to speak, those who want to become a separate republic or join Ireland, 
they never gave in. And actually, until the 1990s, there was decades of, of guerrilla warfare and terrorism and so on. Uh, Good. So once again, uh, let, let me now uh, clarify what we're talking about. Right? This is the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And Great Britain is composed of England, Wales, Scotland. So from now on, you are expected to use these expressions correctly. When you say Great Britain, that's this. When you say the United Kingdom, that's the whole thing. And just to confuse you more, the United Kingdom as such is also called Britain. If you weren't confused enough, here's, here's a chance. So the United Kingdom is also called Britain, this thing. Right? But understand what the United Kingdom is, and now you know why. How about the political system? This is a state. state is unitary and fairly decentralized through devolution. The political system, well, it is, how, how could we characterize it? The United States is a presidential political system. This is the type, not because Obama is president, it is the type, right, of how, what does it talk about? It talks about how the different institutions in the state are organized, how power is shared between them and so on. The political system of the UK is parliamentary. Yeah, we too have a parliament here. Congress is a parliament. Right, so why is it called parliamentary? And you'll see why. But the essence of it is that all that sovereignty, power, rests with the parliament. Why does it rest with the parliament? But let's, we'll see in a second. Another thing that we, you, you can tell me is that the UK is a constitutional what? monarchy. Right? We talked about what? So these two you can tell me when you talk about the political system in the UK. It's a parliamentary system. It's actually one of the major models of parliamentary systems. This is why it's also called the Westminster model. Westminster because this is where the parliament is located. So the Westminster model becomes the model of parliamentary systems in a way. And or constitutional monarchy. So what are the institutions of the political system? Well, let's just see. You have a monarch who can be he, she, whatever. You have a prime minister with a cabinet, you have a lower house, and again, lower upper doesn't tell you anything about power, which is the House of Commons, and look in your textbook for more information, and you have an, let's make a small cabinet here, and you have an upper house, which is the House, so this is House of Commons, and this is House of Lords. You know what? So let's take them one by one. Um, what do you notice here? Where is the executive located? Where is the judiciary located? That's, right? Where is the legislation located? These are the major branches. And what we're studying is how they can be arranged in a modern democracy. Well, which one is the executive? This. Which one? The branch. Which one is the legislative branch? The legislature. This. And the judiciary is separate. You have a system. Of course, we're not going to deal with that now. So let's see how, how uh, first of all, one thing you notice is that, unlike in the US, right, the executive doesn't have one person, but two, which means that the functions of the executive will be split. In the, in the UK and in every parliamentary system, every, so understand that. It doesn't matter if this is a monarch or a president or whatever it's called, chieftain or uh, the big, uh, uh, you know, uh, magical uh, wizard, it doesn't matter how, how they're called. If it's a parliamentary system, you, you will expect it for the executive to have two heads in a way and with different roles. So the monarch is head of state while the prime minister is head of executive or from now on we will call it head of government. What does it mean? Remember what is the state and what is the government, right? The state is this enduring reality of the United Kingdom, which endures through different governments, of course, and even maybe different political systems. Right? The state, the, the borders, the territory run by a set of institutions, we don't know how to organize, remains the same. And that's what the monarch represents. So the monarch's function is symbolic. It's symbolic and bypasses politics. This is why it's so crucial. It's a symbol of unity, and it's, it's a, it's a point, common point of rallying 
It's a crucial symbol, an enduring symbol. And the current monarch has, has been in power, uh, as a monarch, not in power, but has played this role for what, 60 years, 70? How many minute prime ministers have been through? The current monarch was, in, was a monarch when Winston Churchill was prime minister. It gives you a sense of how governments come and go, even political systems can change, not in this case, but can, but the state doesn't. And this is why it's a symbol of endurance. The prime minister is head of executive, head of government. He's the head of the people who run the country. He's the guy in charge of things. Or she, right? Margaret Thatcher. So where is, who has more power? Obviously the prime minister, the monarch, the head of state. The function of a head of state, if it's only a head of state, is symbolic. This is why it's so different from the US, where the symbolic function, the state representation function, is melted together and melds it together with the head of government. And you, in this case, you can curse the prime minister because of his bad policies. It doesn't affect the enduring reality of the state. So then you have a prime minister. But let's not jump to a prime minister. Let's, let's go back to the idea that this is what a parliamentary system. It is a parliamentary system because all power in this system comes from parliament, and especially from the lower house, which is actually the more powerful one. And why is this the more powerful one? We'll see. But which it also, right, we're talking about the representative democracy, and the essence of representative democracy is what? Representation, right? This, remember our chart here, our drawing, that representative democracy means that people govern themselves. So they select representatives who then govern them. Well, where do they send the representatives? Into the legislature. Right? And this is why it's a parliamentary system, because it gives the most power to the representatives of the people, to the legislature. And all power in the system comes from here. That's the essence of parliamentary, that every, every single power in the country comes from the legislature, from the, from the parliament. Why? Because it's the voice of the people. And it's them who then who, it, it's their representatives who then can delegate power to other bodies. So actually the only elected institution, direct elected institution in the country, is the House of Commons, the lower house. The parliament, but only the lower house, we'll see why. So the House of Commons is directly elected. The intellectual system, the way they are elected, similar to the US one, but we'll talk about this later. Each uh, uh, member of parliament, MP, they're called, are elected from one district, but again, this is just one type of election. We'll talk about this later, but what you need to understand is that this is the most powerful body of the parliament, the only directed body. But if it's the only directed body, how do we have a prime minister? It's very simple. Think of the system as me being made up only of parliament with the monarch, which is actually how it was. Well then, what is the executive? The executive is only an arm of the parliament, and that's what it really is. The Prime Minister, how, who is he and how does he become Prime Minister? Simply, the party that wins the election, wins a majority in the House of Commons, gets to appoint its leader as Prime Minister. It's that simple. Actually, it doesn't appoint anything. It's the monarch asks the, win, uh, the, the head of the party that won the election to form an executive. Because the executive is not separated from the legislature. Because the entire political system is the legislature, is the parliament. And parliament only, oh, let's create an arm that is executive arm. In fact, PM and all members of cabinet are members in parliament. It's as if, you know, President Obama would be a member in Congress. Why? Because they're delegated, they're sent from here to run the country on a daily basis. The executive is just an arm of the legislature in a way. So what you have is, instead of what you, we have in the U.S., separation of powers of legislature and executive, what we have here is a fusion of powers. Because the, the legislative and the uh, executive power are fused. And remember, what is the legislative branch? It represents and legislates. People send their voices, and the representatives then make rules for the people to live by. That's representation. Executive is the guys in charge, and the girls in charge with running the country, applying those laws, right? in principle. But because this is fused, it's just a part another aspect of the power of the legislature. 
So all the members of the cabinet and the prime minister are members actually from either the lower house or the upper house. Now what is this upper house? We're going to get back here and talk about what the cabinet is. The upper house is, look at the name, it's called the House of Lords. Why? Well, think of its history that we just discussed in the previous uh, lecture oh, with the maps. House of Lords. It's that initial original parliament. It's at the, its successor. It's the house that gathers the nobles. Indeed. Who are the members of the House of Lords? There are three types uh, of members uh, for the House uh, of Lords, which is clearly not elected, right? Because who are the members? They're called peers. P-E-E-R-S. -E -E and again, you have the textbook section. If anything you can't understand, look it up there. Uh, you can find it there. There are hereditary peers, which means that those who inherit their position. There are uh, life peers, which means that they get their position for life. And there are, um, well, bishops. Indeed, bishops. And archbishops in the Church of England. So how? Well, nobles get their title through family, her heritage. And this being the house of the nobles, they became members through simply by being nobles. And at a certain point, they were real. More than a thousand, I don't know how many, actually, in the thousand something, in 600, 1600, uh, 1600 in, or more, 1800, in, in the night up to the 90s. But, but there were some significant reforms uh, in the 90s, so they eliminated most hereditary peers. So today, you only have about 100 of them, maybe, not all of them active. But it's still based on hereditary uh, heredity. Then you have life peers, and these are people appointed for life by who? This is a good question. Right? Who appointed? Them? Well, most of the things that are done in this country are done through, uh, or many of them, through the signature of the monarch. So formally, the monarch appoints members as life peers because she represents what the state. But. Because it's just a constitutional monarchy, the monarchy is just a symbol, right, a ceremonial factor, official stamp. Most power is actually in the representative of the people and actually in the most active engine in this government, which is the prime minister. Prime minister. So there is, there is a series, series of, of, of powers that the monarch formally has, signs laws, signs treaties, appoints people here, appoints people there, but actually it's all that power formally done, signed by the monarch, is actually performed by the prime minister, which makes him very powerful. So, and then you have bishops. Why bishops? What? Religion, politics, all that nonsense. Well, think again of the Anglican Church. That political identity and national identity is British, right? And political uh, identity and the very entity of the United Kingdom was intertwined with the church, this church that Henry VIII created by cutting it from the Rome, from the Catholic Church. That's why, it's very simple. Being British became synonymous with being Anglican. Of course, things ch changed and some of them had to immigrate to the North America to be able to be something else. But that is why, because it's a state church. It's a state church. Yeah. Good. So, but the most of the members of the upper house are actually life peers. Now, you're going to ask me, so what is the power of the House of Lords? This unelected, undemocratic, goodness me, uh, house, right? Well, you'll see how the forces of you know, democratization, this whole process, these, all, all these factors that created the modern state and modern political systems have affected also this system, but in a gradual way, so the House of Commons has become increasingly more powerful in the last 200 years, and today it is the most powerful body because of the principle of democracy, representation. Which means that all laws uh, need to be approved by the House of Commons. What can the House of Lords do? Because all laws can have to go through both houses. But wait a minute, two houses? Well, that makes this a what? A bicameral parliament, just like in the US, meaning two chambers, lower power. So all laws need to go through both houses, but the lower house can overcome opposition from the upper house. And if the role of the upper house is not to oppose, the role of the upper house, they have developed the role of being the house of debate, the house of expertise, the house of talking about things, of examining it. And sometimes the 
uh, laws are sent there just to be you know, manipulated and worked on and so on. Okay. But let's go on back here, fusion of powers. Who are these people? All of them are members, either in the lower house, most of them are here, and it, in the lower house, in the what? In the majority party, which means that whichever party wins the election actually controls the entirety of the executive. And since this upper house is just a house for negotiation, for, for debate, for analysis, who, whichever party wins power here, wins the entire system. That's the point here. It's a fusion of powers. So that party sends its members in parliament here. So all the cabinet members are actually members also in parliament. What, are, what is a cabinet and what are the cabinet members? A cabinet, from the, in the US, anywhere else, but here it's not so visible, this is why I didn't spend time on it, but everywhere else, the cabinet is made of ministers. We call it here, in the US, they call them secretaries of various departments. But around the world, they're called ministries, and the, the persons holding that position, ministers. And if you want to see an excellent and tremendously amusing uh, sort of a sitcom, but a very it's not a sitcom, uh, a light sitcom, but it's actually an analysis of political politics in, in the UK. It's called Yes Minister and then Yes Prime Minister, the two series. In the 80s, it was very successful and excellently well done about this political system. It's about a minister. So each minister runs a, a, a ministry in charge with other aspects of life, of policy making. So education, social uh, issues. Uh, in the sense of you know uh, welfare and so on, health, uh, defense, uh, uh, interior, which is police, uh, foreign affairs. So you see, these are the functions of the state and of the government, right? And uh, that that we're talking about. And each ministry has its all. It's it's an entire administration throughout the country that is run from by the minister. We're going to talk about administration and bureaucracy in the next section. So, all the ministers are appointed by the Prime Minister after he receives his uh, position, and from whom? Again, from the party in charge. And what remains to be said here, just uh, briefly, because I don't want to go further into uh, discussion, well, maybe just that much, that because of this system, the most important actor today in the political system in the UK is the Prime Minister. It has developed over time because just like in the US where the President is the most important actor, although it's not so in the Constitution, well in the UK, the prime, because of the centralization of power in the modern state, the fact that the central government has continuously acquires more and more power and functions and responsibilities, think of the New Deal here in the US, right, in the uh, mid-century, so the PM is not the most powerful individual. And another reason why it's so powerful is because he is both head of party and head of executive, and he can give you positions, and every single member of parliament wants to be what? A member in the executive. Can the parliament check on the PM? Yes, it can remove it. It's called a motion uh, of censure, or a motion of no confidence, by which it votes that it doesn't have confidence in the government and so on. But why would the party in power remove its own government? And it's the same people who are here and who are here. Fusion of powers. So obviously the PM has all these implicit roles. But notice that a, a member in the cabinet, the minister or the PM, has so many functions. And they're not direct, uh, they elected us in these positions, they're elected here. So a PM is the head of executive, it's also an MP. Yeah, he keeps his seat here. And in the next election, he needs to continuously win that seat in order for him to be here, because then he can be delegated uh, as a PM. So just a sense of, of how a parliamentary system can work. Final words uh, about the organization of the country today. As I said, it's a unitary state still, but it's highly decentralized. It's devolved. This devolution. A devolution means that London has recreated a parliament in Belfast, Northern Ireland, a parliament in Scotland, that's in uh, Edinburgh, and a parliament in Cardiff, and that's in Wales. So, since the last, in the last 15 years, all the process, remember, of creating the United Kingdom was to take power from here and get rid of these parliaments. A revolutionary change has happened in the 15, last 15 years, 
that they have been recreated by the central government and they each have different powers, some more, some less, least, more, and even more power. But remember that it's a still unitary state and it's up to the London government to give and take this power. They allow for this parliament to exist, but sometimes they can take away power. It's not it's still a unitary state, but it's highly involved. And now with the referendum, the Scottish have acquired even more power. But why didn't they vote to secede then? But that's the point. It's a point of identity. Why would they? That was the whole debate. Why would they? They're Scottish and British. Well, why did the Irish secede? Why did they want independence? Because they were more Irish than uh, you know, British. That's the inter intertwining of nationhood, statehood. Not the same thing. So the United Kingdom has four nations. But it's, it's a multinational state. And, but these nations, the members here, some Scottish feel more British than Scottish, some feel more Scottish than British, and so on. Okay, thank you. Send me your questions. You have them using the, the your questions uh, open discussion section. Next country to study that we will study is France.